Live Fit Podcast, Episode 91, with the author of Sweet Poison, David Gillespie. David had a problem many have. He reached his breaking point after trying every diet known to mankind. I thought to myself, I need to figure out why I'm so overweight and what to do about it. It's not like I'd, you know, woken up one morning uh, weighing, you know, 90 pounds too much. It was, it was, uh, you know, I'd worked pretty hard at it over the years. He knew that by the 21st century, we should know what is making people fat. So he did a lot of really extensive research and kept coming to the same result. Look, the reason humans get fat is because they consume too much of something called fructose. He set out to ingest no sugar at all. He wanted to go sugar-free, but he soon found it was not as easy as he thought. The yogurt that I was feeding the kids, you know, was 20% sugar. And I thought, well, hang on, it looks like there's a lot of sugar already added into the food. And when I started finding it in savory things, you know, like in barbecue sauces and, and things like that, which were more than half sugar. In fact, the primary ingredient was sugar or, or 99% fat-free mayonnaise where the primary ingredient was sugar. Then I, I realized this was going to be an awful lot harder than I thought it was going to be. It was a very difficult task since sugar hides in all kinds of foods with many different names. But I did it anyway. Managed to eliminate any source of fructose in my diet. And the weight started coming off. And over the course of probably about 18 months, I lost 90 pounds. Um, hit the weight I am currently now. This is you know, 13, uh, 11 years ago now. Um, and have stayed the same ever since. Welcome to the Live Fit Podcast with Glenn Johnson, your resource for all things that contribute to good health. You will hear expert advice and interviews with leading authorities on fitness, food, fat loss, mindset, and the mind-body connection. You will find show notes, articles, and health programs at livefitpodcast.com. Ah, uh, yes, it is time once again for the Lift Fit Podcast. I'm your host, Glenn Johnson. Thank you, everybody, for listening, and welcome to episode 91. This is part three of my sugar series. Today, I'm speaking with the author of Sweet Poison. His name is David Gillespie. But first, I want to cover some housekeeping. If you appreciate the show, please rate, review, and subscribe. This will help others find it and spread the word any way you can so we can spread this good word of good health and fitness and remind people it's not all that hard and it is absolutely worth it. Another way you can show your support is by going to patreon.com slash livefitpodcast. There's also a link on the website. Just click the big orange banner or the blue one down at the bottom of the show notes pages and you can... Donate anything you're comfortable giving, a dollar a show perhaps, that's all it takes. I'd also like to point out that on my website, you'll find weight management, health improvement programs, and health coaching. If you have any questions, you may email me at glenn, with two n's, glenn at livefitpodcast.com, or you can leave a voice message. There's a link once again on the website. Now, let me tell you a little bit about David. David Gillespie is a father of six young children, including a set of twins. One day he reached his breaking point and after trying every diet on the market and failing to keep off the 90 extra pounds he had gained, he used his skills as a corporate lawyer to find a solution. He deciphered the latest medical findings on diet and weight gain and what he found was chilling. Being fat was the least of his problems. He needed to stop poisoning himself. And that's where our story starts. Hey, David, how are you doing today? Good, Glenn. How are you? I'm doing very well, and you sound pretty good. I, you, you do have a little bit of fuzz on your voice, but you are coming from the exact opposite side of the world from where I am. I'm in Portland, Oregon, and you're in Brisbane, Australia, correct? That's right. Yep. And it's a beautiful morning here in Brisbane, nine o'clock in the morning. I, well, it's afternoon for me and it's about 110, 105 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's quite a warm day. I've been to Brisbane quite a long time ago, but it was beautiful there. Stayed on the Gold Coast for a while and, and traveled all the way up to Cairns and saw the saltwater crocs and, and back down to Sydney. It was a pretty wild ah. experience. Oh, you know, you know the area then. Uh, yeah, I've just, in fact, uh, my boys have just been skiing uh, down south, uh, and uh, just just this minute walked back in from uh, collecting them from the airport. Uh, so uh, it's good timing for me. 
Oh, neat. That's that's great. Uh, skiing. That sounds kind of funny since uh, it's here. <laughs> it's summer for us, and it's, like I said, it's quite warm today. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you guys are a, a little bit uh, opposite of us. Yep. Quite a bit opposite back, of back us. To front. Although the temperature is not a lot different, I think today uh, at the moment it's about. 25 degrees here. I don't know what that is in the old money that you guys use, but uh, it's pretty warm. It's 25 Celsius. Yeah. <laughs> but I have some relatives down there. Uh, my cousin Carolyn's been on the show a couple times before, and I have an uh, aunt and uncle, Alvin and Leslie, that live down in Sydney Way. And then uh, they have another kid, Gregory. So he's my other cousin. And uh, I don't suppose you know him. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe. All right, enough of the chit chat, David. Um, the reason I brought you on is because I am um, doing a series on sugar, just talking about really the hidden dangers of sugar. And it's a shame that it tastes so good and it's so sweet and brings enjoyment to so many people's lives, but it also has a negative side. It also will definitely harm your health. And in doing my research, I found quite a few books with your name as the author. And the first one, I believe, is the first one you wrote, and this is the one that got my attention. It says Sweet Poison, and that title really hit home with me because that's exactly what I'm seeing. And the uh, subtitle is Why Sugar Makes Us Fat. Now, in looking at this book and finding out about you and reading your bio, it says that you are a recovering corporate lawyer and then you, I'm assuming, quit do quit doing that and started writing a book about the harms of sugar. Can you explain kind of the sure. what what in, inspired you or transpired to make you shift from such a a wildly different career to now being an author about nutrition? Uh, yeah. Okay. So um, I haven't stopped being a lawyer. Um, no one makes enough money from selling books to uh, give up their primary career. I wouldn't have thought, um, uh, unless you happen to write about Harry Potter. But <laughs> um, what I, the, why I wrote that book uh, was, uh, and it came out in two thousand eight, and uh, I wrote that because uh, in two thousand and three I had quit sugar, and the reason I'd done it was because I was um, very overweight, um, morbidly obese probably is the medical definition for it. Um, uh, and I had very little understanding as to why. Um, we had four kids under the age of eight um, and I was struggling to keep up with them uh, when uh, my wife rather inconsiderately announced that um, she was going to produce twin babies to add to that mix, oh. uh, which meant that we'd have six kids under the age of nine and and I, as I said, wasn't keeping up with the four we had, let alone adding twin babies to it. So I thought to myself, I need to figure out why I'm so overweight and what to do about it. It's not like I'd, you know, woken up one morning uh, weighing, you know, 90 pounds too much. It right. was, it was, uh, you know, I'd worked pretty hard at it over the years and, um, <laughs> and you know, it, you know, a couple of pounds here and there and, and, you know, slowly getting bigger and bigger. And, and every now and then I decided, oh, I'll, I'll, you know, I'd hear about a, a diet on television or, you know, fitness craze or whatever it was and I'd, I'd give it a go uh, and they'd all work. Uh, that will work brilliantly for exactly as long as my willpower would hold out, um, mm. uh, which in my case was about two weeks. Um, so, um, you know, in those two weeks, you lose two to four pounds and um, then the willpower would give out and that weight would come back, usually with a little bit of interest for good measure. And what I didn't understand about that, looking around at every other species of animal on the planet, was they all seem to control their weight on autopilot. You know, mm -hmm. they control their weight the same way they control their heartbeat or their breathing. Um, the only exception to that rule appeared to be humans and any animal unfortunate enough to be fed by humans. Yes. Um, and I thought, surely, you know, 21st century, we must know enough about the science of the human body to understand what is going on. And surely I am just misinterpreting. You know, when I hear the messages about what to do, perhaps I'm doing something wrong, not understanding it, whatever. So I took the only relevant skill I had as a lawyer, um, uh, which was an ability to investigate, you know, to read evidence. Lawyers, journalists have that in common, which is 
uh, they're in professions where they are not really experts of anything um, in particular. Um, but, and as a result, every time they make a statement, they have this little warning in their head that is, if you're going to state a fact, then there has to be a footnote after it that says where the fact came from. Um, and so lawyers and journalists share that in common, which is verifiable sources of evidence. Right. Um, so I went looking for that. Uh, I said, okay, let me understand what the what the story is here, how the human body works. Let me understand what the evidence says. What do we know? What don't we know? Um, and I very quickly discovered that there was a quite a long line of evidence that I, at least, had never been aware of uh, that said, going right back to the end of the Second World War and even earlier, um, saying, look, the reason humans get fat is because they consume too much of something called fructose. Um, and I thought, oh, that's interesting. I wonder where that is. So that sounds like something in fruit. Um, <laughs> so I went digging further and, and, and found that actually, uh, yes, it is in fruit, but the primary delivery mechanism for fructose in today's society uh, turns out to be sugar. Uh, in, in Australian society, it's cane sugar, which is half fructose. Um, uh, in the US, it's they, you, you guys make your sugar from corn rather than from grass well, from a different kind of grass being corn, uh, and it's high fructose corn syrup. But either way, it's about half fructose. And there's a good reason for that, which is that fructose is what makes food taste sweet. And turns out that science was well and truly established um, by the time I was looking at it. It just didn't seem to be part of the mainstream perception about weight control. Um, there seemed to be almost no evidence about the fact that sugar definitively causes people to not only be overweight but gives them fatty liver disease type 2 diabetes heart disease uh, chronic kidney disease and, and, and a whole cascade of diseases by virtue of the way it is metabolized none of that evidence appeared to be at least in anything that i had ever seen and instead there was all of this talk about you know eat less saturated fat eat less cholesterol exercise more all of that kind of thing which i all of which i had tried but none of which seemed to work unless you were massively determined to apply huge amounts of willpower and i thought well if what the science says about fructose is true then the way it works its magic um, of making us fat is by interfering with our ability to control what we eat. So it messes with our appetite control system, our, auto, our autopilot, the thing that every other animal on the planet relies upon to maintain their weight automatically. And so if that science is correct, I thought all I've got to do is take that substance out of my diet and um, everything should self-correct. And so I thought I'll give it a go. Now, at first I thought that would be terribly easy because I didn't add sugar to anything. I didn't put sugar in my cups of tea. I didn't uh, add sugar to my breakfast cereal. Uh, and I thought, well, I'm not eating much sugar anyway, so all I've got to do is just, you know, keep an eye out for it, not add it to anything and, you know, avoid the Mars bars and the, you know, cans of Coke, and I'll be fine. Um, then I started reading labels. Uh, and I realized that my healthy uh, breakfast cereal, which is endorsed by the Heart Foundation, um, was 30% sugar, and, and I found that you know that the, the the yogurt that I was feeding the kids, you know, was 20% sugar. And I thought, well, hang on, it looks like there's a lot of sugar already added into the food. And when I started finding it in savoury things, you know, like in barbecue sauces and, and and things like that, which were more than half sugar. In fact, the primary ingredient was sugar, or or 99% fat-free mayonnaise, where the primary ingredient was sugar. Then I I realised it was going to be an awful lot harder than I thought it was going to be. Um, but I did it anyway, managed to eliminate any source of fructose in my diet and the weight started coming off. And over the course of probably about 18 months, I lost 90 pounds, um, hit the weight I am currently now, this is you know, 13, uh, 11 years ago now, um, and have stayed the same ever since uh, because my appetite control no longer has the thing breaking it in my diet. Um, and the result is that you revert to nature, <laughs> essentially. Your appetite control works exactly as designed, um, and you don't gain weight. Wow. That's uh, really uh, amazing that it was th that clear-cut for you once, you once you hit on what the thing is. I think that's what a lot of people do when they try different diets. They're thinking, 
this time they're going to find that one thing. Um, and which brings me to a question I had early on when you were speaking. I didn't want to interrupt, but what kinds yeah. of diets were you following before you started uh, really investigating oh, you, fructose? You name it, I tried it. Uh, you know, whatever happened to be on television at the time, you know, the Atkins diet or the uh, low fat diet or the, you know, walking the dog around the block every day diet or, <laughs> you know, the, the, whatever happened to come up, you know, you see it on television, you read it in the paper or something like that and you'd give it a go and figure, oh, well, this might work. Um, and like I said, they all did. And none of them was any more effective than any other. They, they, they were all very effective. Um, it's just they required enormous amounts of willpower. And I once heard uh, Gary Taubes, who you may know, uh, uh -huh. he wrote Good Calories, Bad Calories, and, and I met him once and we, we had a chat about this. And, and he told me a story which, which just really rang true with me in that uh, scenario, which is, he said, if, if I was going to throw a, a huge meal uh, tonight, and I was going to say caviar, French champagne, as much as you can eat, the best lobster, everything, and I told you the day before that I was going to have that and you're invited, you come along and eat as much as you want, what would you do? And, and I said, oh, you know, I might you know, skip breakfast, I want to have, have a good appetite for this meal, get, get good value <laughs> out of it. And he said, you know, what else might you do? He said, I you know, might even do a bit, of more, bit more exercise, work up a bit of appetite. And, and he said, exactly. He said, that's what everybody would do. Um, and he said, and what does that sound like? It sounds like exactly what we tell people who are overweight to do. We say, eat less, skip a meal, um, exercise more. And the reason you said you were going to do it when I just asked you then was that you wanted to increase your appetite in preparation for this fabulous meal. He said, but we tell people who are overweight to do exactly those things and expect the outcome not to be an increase in appetite. Uh, and it, there's a certain logic to that. Um, there is. And, and he's, he's right. That is the nature of diets is we tell people to do things which will cause them to eat more in essence. Um, and he says, fundamentally, they won't work. And, and, and fundamentally, it won't work because what we are dealing with is something that breaks a, an endocrine-driven control of our appetite, an automatic system, no less automatic than how we control our heartbeat or how we control how many breaths a minute we take. Um, and once that thing is removed from your system, your appetite can work exactly the same. You can eat whatever you like, but your appetite will tell you when to stop. Right. And, you know, it, it's funny because we are constantly, you know, trying to give our advice to people and, and ask them to control their eating. But what I found, it's not really about willpower. You were, you were saying that you're, you, try, you, would work, you would go on a diet and then your willpower would fail and then you'd be off it until you would get fed up and go back on it again. And what I found is that willpower will fail every time. And what you're dealing with, what you were just talking about, is you have a physiological need for calories, and then there's the psychological need for calories. And as soon as you tell somebody they can't have something, even if they tell themselves they can't have something, well, there's nothing else they think about. Oh, my goodness. If I told you don't think about a pink elephant and I continue talking, <laughs> you might be listening to me, but in the back of your mind, you're thinking about a pink elephant. And if yeah. I said, no matter what, don't think about a pink elephant. Are you thinking about one right now? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> and now, uh, um, another word for willpower is manual override. Uh, and I'll give you another example. Uh, if I said to you now, hold your breath yeah. um, and tell me when you can no longer hold it anymore. Now, if you're really, really good, you'll, you'll last 90 seconds. Um, mm -hmm. And that's a manual override. You have an automatic system that makes you consume exactly as much oxygen as you need according to what you're doing. If you're sitting still, you'll consume less. If you're moving around, you'll consume more. If you're running a marathon, you'll consume a lot more. Um, and that's all automatic. You, you don't have, that all happens without you having to think about anything. But you can override it using willpower. In other words, a manual override. You can stop. Uh, and that is the nature of dieting. It's a manual override on a different energy system. One is about oxygen, the other is about glucose, which is our, you know, we work, we're a machine that burns glucose using oxygen. Um, that's it in its simplest form. Uh, mm -hmm. And you can override those systems. And dieting is a manual override on the consumption of the glucose. And uh, 
breathing, you know, holding your breath is a manual override on the consumption of the oxygen. Now, people say to me, oh, when I give that example, that's not a very realistic example. You don't tell people to diet to stop eating altogether, which is what you're telling someone to do when they hold their breath. True. Uh, no, but if I said to you, count up how many breaths you take in the next half an hour, uh, and and then said to you, uh, let's say that number is, I don't know, 300 uh, and uh, or whatever it is. Uh, and I said to you, now take 10 percent off that and do that for the rest of your life. Count up 90 percent of the breaths that you would normally take, uh, you know, and do that for the rest of your life. And you would say that's thoroughly, completely impossible. I couldn't do that for the rest of the day, let alone for the rest of my life. But that's exactly <laughs> what we are telling people to diet. When we tell people to diet, that's exactly what we tell them to do. Count up the number of calories of energy that you consume, take 10 percent off and do that for the rest of your life. Right. Um, and it's ridiculous. And you can't do it because you're trying to manage a highly complex manual system, uh, automatic system with a manual override of the most primitive form. Yeah, that's true. That's true. It's that's that's a great example. I've I've never thought about that way. I've done the holding the breath thing, and of course, the, like the pink elephant with I, what I do with you. One thing I tell people is not to rely on willpower. And as soon as somebody says, "I just don't have the willpower," or says just the word willpower alone, that is just a big ginormous red flag. And then I usually talk to them about skill power, and willpower is just hoping that something works and that some magical force will come out from you and say, no, I'm not going to eat that chocolate cake. But if you skill power, you set yourself up so you aren't hungry and have a piece of cake sitting in front of you at that time. You arrange your day, your meals, your, your whatever it is for success rather than hoping that you succeed. Yeah, and, and that might work for some people, but it would never work for me. Um, what I actually had to do was remove the thing that was messing up my autopilot. Um, and and now hundreds of thousands of books sold later, I get constant feedback from people who've done it um, who say it works exactly the same for me as it worked for you, uh, which is you take that thing out, your appetite works as normal. You don't feel like you're on a diet. You're just avoiding things that taste sweet. Um, other than that, you eat whatever you want, uh, and weight just comes off you. Well, no, that does actually sound like skill power because you've you've set a system in place that prevents you from needing willpower. So you're you're using yeah, the skill. You're, you're yeah. getting fructose out of your diet completely. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, you don't you don't have to think about it. You don't have to use willpower. There is no willpower involved in it, right? Other than obeying one rule. And Which that is, is exactly what yeah. I'm talking about with skill power yeah. is setting yeah. yourself up for success in whatever method it takes. And so you've mm -hmm. you've uh, removed fructose. Yep. Now I'd like to go back to when you were doing your research. How did you find that fructose was what caused uh, consistent or overactive hunger? Uh, yeah, so the research has been there for a long time. I guess the one advantage I had in doing this, so think about the time frame that this was happening. So I was looking for these answers in 2003, 2004, which is probably around about the earliest point in time in human history when a lay person could, using nothing more sophisticated than a computer sitting on their desk, access every medical library in the world. Um, and every medical journal and every article ever written. Um, prior to then, it would have been a massive undertaking, uh, you know, a truly massive undertaking. You would have had to have gone and visited some of these libraries, uh, used card indexes to search some of these articles. Cross-linking them would have been an absolute nightmare, searching for the word fructose in, in an endocrinology journal and then comparing to where it's being used in a urology journal. Uh, yeah, completely impossible prior to about then. So it was probably the earliest point in time that anyone could have done what I did. Um, but uh, I did, and, and it, because it was there and it was easy. And what I found is that there was a very strong line of research, you know, in various places in the world. So starting in the United Kingdom, uh, just after the Second World War with the establishment of the London School of Nutrition uh, by a fellow by the name of John Yudkin, um, who was a, a specialist, um, who observed that he couldn't make laboratory animals fat using fat um, but he could easily do it using carbohydrates and then he narrowed it down and and found that it was in fact the fructose half of sugar 
that was the, the having the effect. Um, and, and then he started he transferred those experiments into into small human trials. And then those were picked up by the USDA labs uh, in Maryland uh, in the early 70s after he put out a book in 1972 called uh, I think Sweet White and Deadly or something like that. Yes. And the, um, you know that that. And then the USDA lab started looking at it and they replicated some of the experiments, got the same results, took them further. Um, and then you started seeing the the uh, you, the um, the magnificent uh, team out there at UC Berkeley, uh, you know, with um, uh, Stanhope and uh, uh, doing incredible things with human trials, proving exactly the same things. And and it just was, you know, it started as a theory that said, wow, we're noticing that this stuff really hurts these animals. Not only does it make them fat, it gives them fat liver disease, gives them type 2 diabetes and eventually kills them. Um, but being able to reproduce exactly the same trajectories in humans. And it became really quite unequivocal by the time Sweet Poison came out uh, in, in 2008. You know, the evidence was all there. And and I wasn't really speculating in any big way. All I was doing was just drawing it all together and saying, look, there is a convincing trail of evidence here that says this is dangerous stuff. I, of course, had reached that conclusion already in 2003, but, you know, the publishing process being what it was, <laughs> it didn't end up in a book until 2008. So what pointed you to fructose in the first place? Uh, it was that. It was those trials by Yudkin in the first place. I mean, he, okay. in fact, had drawn on... Some earlier stuff uh, by a fellow, uh, the Reverend Captain Cleave, who was a British Navy captain, who had first twigged to the concept that maybe sugar was a bit of a problem, and he, and he he'd done it uh, by uh, noticing a graph of sugar consumption in the UK that uh, no one else seemed to have noticed or cared about, which showed that sugar consumption had gone from almost nothing in the 1700s through to uh, you know truly humongous amounts uh, by the time he was looking at it in the 1940s, uh, and. Uh, Yadkin had read Cleve's work, as I understand it, and and said, well, if it is the sugar that's doing this, um, is is there some metabolic or, or biochemical explanation for why it might? Um, and so there were very early suspicions about sugar um, in that literature. And by 1972, when Yadkin put his book out, um, those suspicions were confirmed by a lot of observation. Uh, still not a lot of endocrinology because a lot of the hormones involved hadn't yet been discovered. Um, but uh, a lot of, you know, fairly strong circumstantial evidence. Uh, and so I went looking for, for, for where we'd gotten to since 1972. What had we gotten to? Because we'd done a lot of work on hormones since then. You know, there was a lot of in-depth work on that uh, being done after that. Had it proved what Yudkin had theorized or, or had it disproved it was what I was interested in. And, and I found that the evidence was there in spades. Um, but it just wasn't getting through to the mainstream. And I began to suspect that there was a very good reason for that, which is that food with sugar sells an awful lot better than food without sugar. Uh, and there are very large vested commercial interests in making sure that we really don't stop eating sugar. So is there a, a conspiracy that is keeping this information from becoming wide? Oh, I, don't, I, think, knowledge? I, I think conspiracies are probably a big call. I don't think they're that coordinated. I, I think it's I think it's just a conspiracy of money in the sense that um, there are a lot of people in whose best interest it is to uh, to keep this um, as obscure as possible, very much as it was with tobacco. Um, you know, we had up until the mid 90s, we had people standing up in before US Senate inquiries saying, hand on heart, there is no, you know, a, 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 tobacco is not addictive. Right. Um, it was that recent. Uh, and, and before that, we had 40 years of science that said the exact opposite. Um, but there's a lot of money involved. And did they conspire with each other? Well, probably in little bits and pieces, but there was no over, uh, overarching conspiracy to keep it from us. It was just, wherever possible muddy the waters uh wherever possible say oh the science is not in uh you know delay it another 10 years in the hope that the the profit party continues 
It's more of a conspiracy of philosophy. All people with the similar philosophies want to move things to you know further their own interests, and that turns into a conspiracy, conspiracy without the actual uh, communication going on is how I see it. Yeah, well, when it comes down for, for any given company to a choice between their profit tomorrow and your health in 20 years' time, <laughs> they have no choice. Right. <laughs> that, that, that isn't a choice as far as they're concerned. Um, and, and in our current economic system, no comp a company would be sued by its shareholders were it to say, I am denying profit today because I don't wish to harm my consumers in 20 years. Uh, you know, they'd, they'd be hauled before a court within seconds because that's the nature of our economic system. Wow, that's a shame. So what's the light at the end of the tunnel with all this? Uh, well, it's already happening. Uh, I mean, Sweet Poison came out, uh, you know, eight years ago now. Um, in, in, a, in the UK, they've implemented a sugar, or are just about to implement a sugar tax. In a large number of US states, it's being seriously considered. Um, uh, the, you know, this it's not being considered in Australia because we're the world's largest sugar exporter. So, you know, it'll take a lot of a lot of mountains to move before anyone does anything about it here. But I, um, I saw your fields of sugar cane going up the uh, that's right. up the coast, going up to Cairns. It, it was just it, massive. It employs, employs a lot of people, um, and a lot of politicians uh, votes uh, depend on it. Um, so, uh, I can't. I'm not holding my breath for big changes here. Um, but uh, in world, in countries in the world where the health of their citizens is more important than the profit, um, it is starting to move. Uh, you know, we've got the World Health Organization saying do not consume more than twelve teaspoons of sugar a day, and and preferably less than six. Now, you know, for a sense of scale, a, a can of Coke has ten teaspoons of sugar in it. Um, so. Uh, you know, when we have the World Health Organization saying that, we've got the UK Parliament implementing you know, uh, taxes on this, we've got US states in implementing taxes on this, you've got Mexico implementing a tax on this. It shows a very strong movement. It is starting to become mainstream that people uh, are avoiding fructose. Um, it isn't mainstream in the sense that more than half the population are doing it, but we're getting there. Now, is it possible to eat sugar without ingesting fructose as part of it? Yeah, absolutely. You can have the other half of sugar, which is glucose. Uh, as I said before, we are a machine that runs on glucose. Uh, you know, ultimately, every food we eat uh, gets turned into glucose, which ends up in our bloodstream, which is what we burn in order to live. Um, so every cell in our body can use glucose for energy. No cell in our body can use fructose for energy. Um, right, and the fructose has to be broken down into glucose in the well, liver. Uh, yes, but in most of us, it isn't. Um, in that, what the liver does is only turns it to glucose, well, to glycogen, um, if our glycogen stores are depleted, which for most of us, most of the time, is never. Um, so, unless we are a marathon or it's first thing in the morning, uh, we are mostly operating on full glycogen stores. So, uh, fructose's primary path in the liver is yes, top up the glycogen stores if we need it, but then every other molecule of glucose immediately turn into fat, um, which is stored in the liver, which is why we are facing an epidemic of fatty liver disease. Fatty right. liver disease leads to hepatic insulin resistance, which leads to muscular insulin resistance, which leads to type two diabetes. Fatty liver disease also leads to um, obviously um, destruction of the liver itself. Uh, and, and, and that's why we're seeing uh, rates of um, uh, you know, liver cancer and, and various intermediate diseases go out of control there. Turning fructose into fat produces as a byproduct uric acid, which is why we're seeing an epidemic of gout. Uric acid has to be eliminated from the body, which is which has to go through the kidneys, which is why we're seeing a, a, an epidemic of chronic kidney disease. Um, so all of these cascades come from that one little thing, which is glucose is used by every cell in the body for energy. Fructose is converted to fat by the liver that one little thing. And people initially, when they discovered that, thought, oh, that's why it makes us fat. That's obviously uh, intuitive, but wrong, um, in that the creating of fat doesn't make us fat. We eat fat and it doesn't make us fat. It's the, the other uh, property of fructose, which is that it also biochemically interferes with our appetite control centers um, that, that causes us to also overeat. Can you explain that? Sure. Okay. So uh, one of the things that started to come up when we started to do uh, analysis of the actual biochemistry of fructose, rather than just guessing from observation what was going on, um, 
was that we found that a peculiar property of fructose, uh, unique to it, um, and this has been verified by multiple studies since uh, in humans, is that it actually interferes with the appetite control centers in our brain. Um, so uh, the, the little bit that remains in our bloodstream, um, most of it is going to be metabolized to fat, but the little bit that remains in our bloodstream actually interferes with our perception of how full we are. In that when you put people on diets that are higher in fructose, uh, their perception of fullness decreases, their satiety decreases. When you put them on diets which are full of glucose, their perception of society, satiety increases, even though the calorie count for both of them is exactly the same. Um, so uh, it, it's an interesting property of, of fructose. Uh, even worse than that, they found that it also interferes with our other appetite control hormone, which is leptin, which is the one which is released by our fat cells. So the more fat cells, we, and this is a really neat system, the more fat cells we have, the more leptin we have, and therefore the less we wish to eat. It's our body saying, hey, we've got plenty of fuel on board, we don't need to eat anything. Um, fructose interferes with that signal so that we become uh, in, uh, leptin insensitive as a result of consuming fructose. That's really amazing. It's really unfortunate. And the the biggest problem I see with that with you know, somebody like me who tries to keep his sugar down, of course, you know, we'll eat some now and then, but one thing I really love is fruit. And of course, that's what makes fruit sweet. And that's where fructose got its name was from fruit. Yeah. So what do you have to say about people who, who eat fruit, but don't eat, don't drink the fruit juice and stay away from other, uh, other sweet things? We're evolved to cope with fruit. I mean, as far as fruit, I mean, if, if you think about fruit in evolutionary terms, um, fruit is a, its purpose, as far as the tree is concerned, is to get an animal to eat it. Um, so you make it as attractive to the animal as humanly possible. Um, and the way to do that is give them something that animals really like. If trees could put nicotine in fruit, they would. Um, uh, the best thing they've got available is a slight twist to the glucose molecule, which turns into a fructose molecule that animals really like um, because it's really, really sweet. So it's the bait. Uh, for the animal to distribute the seed of the tree, if you like. Um, from the animal's perspective, uh, it's actually noxious. It's a poison, no less a poison than alcohol. Uh, but it's one to which all animals are well adapted. Um, you know, the occasional bit of fruit isn't going to hurt them. They're well adapted to that. Their liver can deal with it. It'll turn it into fat. Uh, the turning it into fat bit, just like with turning alcohol into fat, is the defense against the toxin <laughs> um you know it's neutralizing it it's turning into fat you know fat's actually useful you don't want to waste those calories um so turn it into fat um and that all works beautifully when what you're talking about is occasional exposure when you're talking about eating a couple of pieces of ripe fruit when in season um you're not going to do yourself any harm whatsoever as long as you're eating the whole fruit and not just extracting the sugar, which is what people do when they juice. Um, uh, they're, they're extracting the sugar, consuming the sugar and throwing everything else away. But if you eat the whole fruit, we are adapted to eat whole fruit in, in its native form. It is slowly absorbed. It is not a big bolus impact on the liver. The liver can deal with it in its own time um, and everything's good. Uh, just as you can have a bit of alcohol every now and then and it's not going to hurt you. It's when you binge drink alcohol that it really starts to do damage. Same deal. Now, would you put any sort of cap on the amount of fruit a person should eat at any one time to prevent negative impact? Uh, no. Um, I mean, I, I say to people, um, think of fruit as nature's dessert, which is what it is. Uh, and um, if, think to yourself as you're about to eat a piece of fruit, um, would I be eating a bowl of ice cream now? You know, would now be an appropriate time for me to eat a bowl of ice cream? If the answer to that is yes, then sure, eat the fruit. If the answer to that is no, it would be kind of bizarre to be eating ice cream right now, um, then perhaps you should reconsider the fruit. Gotcha. So uh, an example, you know, you're, you're at the office uh, and, and you start chowing down on fruit at uh, morning tea time at the office. You, you think, ask yourself, would now be a normal time for me to eat dessert? Um, probably not. But, you know, you've just had a nice meal in a restaurant and they bring a fruit platter around. That would be a normal time to eat dessert. Hmm. Gotcha. That makes sense. You are listening to the Live Fit Podcast. If you enjoy this episode, you can show your appreciation by rating, reviewing, and subscribing. You can also view show notes and links at livefitpodcast.com. 
Um, you know, the, the problem I see with this is you really can't eat any sugar because unless you are getting a specific sugar that is separate from fructose, you're going to get fructose, cane sugar and beet sugar Whoa. and honey and you know, Except. fruit juice concentrate all contain, and, and, and agave is even worse, has even more fructose mm -hmm. than anything else. So mm -hmm. when I was in Australia many years ago, in a grocery store, I found a jar of glucose. Mm -hmm. And I opened the thing up and stuck my finger in it. I thought it was going to be as sweet as honey. And to mm -hmm. my surprise, it was barely sweet at all. So yeah. unless you're using something like that, you're probably going to get fructose inside your body. Now, the interesting thing about that, uh, so those glass, jars of glucose, yes, still on sale, clean uh, glucose that you can buy. And as you say, if you're used to eating sugar and you taste that, you will say, well, I could see why a diet that requires you to substitute this for sugar would work because nothing would taste sweet at all. <laughs> um, you know, and, 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 and you're, what you're essentially asking people to do is replace sugar with flour. Um, that's not true because what the interesting thing that happens is that our adaptation to sweetness is variable uh, and our palate ramps up to cope with it. So what I mean by that is when you take fructose out of your diet, things start to taste a lot sweeter um, that previously wouldn't have tasted sweet at all. So if you were to try, if you were to go off sugar, so get through the withdrawal period from sugar, sugar is an addictive substance. It has a withdrawal period the same as nicotine. Get through the withdrawal period from sugar, which is gonna last two to four weeks. Your body during that time will adapt its palate. Um, and if you once again tried that syrup at the end of a withdrawal period, at the start, as you, as you say, bland, nothing. Mm -hmm. <coughs> but by the end, you would say that's sugar. <coughs> In fact, you would swear I had substituted honey for that jar um, because that's what happens to your palate. If you don't expose it to fructose for a long period of time, it adjusts and it finds the sweetness in glucose, which is, as you say, to a sugar eater, not sweet at all. Um, but to someone who's off sugar, it tastes exactly like sugar. That's great. I, that's really well put. And that's very similar to what I tell my clients and listeners is that when they say that they don't like drinking water or something else that's not very sweet, they they, they don't like it. I say that's because you are so conditioned to the sweetness. So you need to get rid of the sweet things you put in your mouth to get rid of the sweet drinks and the sweet foods. And then something that is, you know, currently barely sweet for you will be plenty sweet. I have that problem. The only sweets I eat are some ice cream now and then and fruit. And I can't stand the sweetness of a soda or a lot of these other sweet things that people are eating or drinking all the time. It, it just, it tastes really horrible, literally it tastes horrible. The interesting thing is that even with artificial sweeteners, now I discovered this when I was going through withdrawal, is that at the start, um, I would have as a treat, um, you know, I think, I'm, I think it was Pepsi Max or something, one of those artificially sweetened uh, drinks. And, and the reason I would have it as a treat is because it seemed to me to be just like the real thing, you know, just like, just like a full sugar version of it. It tasted very, very similar, very, very close. And I thought, wow, this is, you know, this is a free ride here. I, I get to have the, the sweet hit, um, but I don't uh, actually consume any fructose. So I thought that was brilliant. The interesting thing is by the end of the withdrawal period, um, I had stopped doing that, not because I was concerned at all about what was in those drinks, um, just because my palate had changed so much by the end that they tasted like soda water um, or spritzer, I think you guys call it, uh, but with chemicals added to it. It didn't taste, at the start, it tasted like it was full of sugar. By the end, it didn't taste like it had sugar in it at all. It tasted to me like water with chemicals um, and was really quite unpleasant. And I thought to myself, well, why not just eat, the, why not just have cold soda water? And then at least it's pleasant. <laughs> um, and 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 that's that was the interesting thing. And people often ask me, you know, is it okay if I have these? And I say, you can have them, but I guarantee you, you won't have them for long, um, because uh, once your palate adjusts, they just don't taste like they should. I find that those diet sodas taste like gasoline. Yeah, they they, they have a real chemical reek to them. Um, and, and that's because your palate is adjusted to it. Now, the interesting thing about uh, glucose, now you talked about the glucose that is sold in jars here. Mm -hmm. There are other sources of it that can be used in recipes. So um, you can buy it in powdered form. Um, and it's, here it's sold as a product called dextrose, uh, just another name for glucose. Right. And it, 
and it looks like caster sugar, really fine white sugar. Um, it, it tastes like flour to someone who's eating sugar, but to someone who's off sugar, it tastes like sugar. Uh, <laughs> and you can buy that in the supermarkets here. Um, it's it, in home brew stores uh, is is a popular place for it because it's used in home brewing. Gotcha. Um, the the other thing you can buy, uh, which is uh, it looks and tastes like honey to someone who's off sugar. Uh, it's called rice malt syrup or barley malt syrup. Um, and that's it's brown, like honey, looks like honey, behaves like honey. Um, and to a person who's off sugar, it tastes like honey. And there's no uh, fructose in it? There's no fructose in it at all. It is uh, glucose, maltose, and maltotriose, which is maltose is two glucose molecules together and maltotriose is three. Uh, the body just treats it all as glucose. Um so uh, those are good options and one of the books that i've written is well now two of the books i've written are recipe books for how to make things using those ingredients um that taste the same to sugar eaters and non-sugar eaters there are some recipes that work well for sugar eaters and non-sugar eaters even using those as the sweeteners rather than sugar so these are recipes like uh, ice cream uh, which doesn't have a lot of sugar to begin with but it does need that slight sweet edge to it um you can make an ice cream using dextrose that tastes exactly the same to people who are eating sugar and people who are not eating sugar anyway so there's there's 180 odd recipes that fit that criteria that are in those books um so and 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 people say to me why did you bother doing recipe books if you're off sugar what you wouldn't even want ice cream uh, and and that's the truth you don't because it's not addictive anymore it's just something to eat uh but it's nice um and you've got to behave normally in a normal society where you are expected you know to bring cupcakes to school uh you know for the for the fundraiser or or you know invite friends over for morning tea and you can't guarantee that all of them are off sugar this that's it, it allows you to be normal well you brought up an interesting point and that's a great segue to what i was going to ask you next is is your family off of fructose oh definitely oh absolutely yes. and <laughs> do your children's friends dislike coming over to your house because of that <laughs> no because you know, what what it's done is um force them to find force our kids to find alternatives there are sweets made with pure glucose um they are getting more and more numerous as more and more people uh, look for alternatives to things sweetened with sugar. You know, uh, the, the sherbets and things like that. I don't know if you have them there, but but and there are some lollipops that are made with them, and and even some popular things like the the Wonka runs, for example, which I know you have there because I've seen them in the stores. Yeah. Um, they they are made with just pure dextrose. So those sorts of things the kids learn where they are and they look for them and they have those as sweet treats but then again they're not addicted to sugar so they're not really not looking for it all that often at the start it was harder for them because they're going to birthday parties where everybody else is eating sugar um and they're not and i say to them look have a bit see how it makes you feel and because they've spent their whole lives off sugar having a bit of sugar is ha has an effect like um binge drinking you know it feels good while you're doing it but then there is a hangover, and it's exactly the same with sugar. You you get a really distinct sugar hangover, and the kids start saying things that you hear people who drink a lot say, "Never again! I'm not doing that again. I feel terrible." Yeah, <laughs> that. And, and 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 honestly, you just keep at it. You just keep going. You know, sometimes they'll eat sugar, sometimes they won't. But you know, here we are now, 12 years down the track, and no, they don't eat sugar, and they don't even miss it. Yeah, that's that's funny. I'm picturing a. A uh, six-year-old laying on the couch with an ice pack on his head, going, "Oh, never again." <laughs> <laughs> they do. That's exactly what they do. <laughs> I've I've experienced the very same thing. I I eat more sugar than I should, but I eat far less than the average American. And uh, every now and then, I'll 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 have a little binge and just feel really bad and say the same things like, "All right, let's let's uh, pump the brakes on this one." And then I'll be then I'll clean myself up for a good week or two. But it's hard I'll because it, unlike, kind. yeah, unlike alcohol, nobody's trying to feed you sugar twenty four seven. Um, you know, you, you're not you're not having your work makes suggest you, you know let's go out for a beer at, at nine in the morning. Uh, you know, it's whereas sugar is ingrained as part of everything you do. Yeah, um, they walk in. Here's a box yeah. of donuts. I'm going to set it right. right by your desk. 
Yeah, no one's walking in with a tray full of vodka shots and putting them on your desk. Um, so it's it's a little different from alcohol in that sense, in that sugar is, is so integrated with our society that it is a lot harder to avoid. Well, a couple uh, years ago, my wife and I did a did this podcast, episode 30 of the Lift Fit podcast, and we called it the sugar battle because we were discussing our battle with sugar and how to keep it out of ours and our children's lives. And we're not trying to be perfect. We're just trying to minimize it as much as possible. But then, mm. you know, friends and family members will offer them sugar. And of, of course they want it. They like it. I've, I've told all this stuff to my kids. I've had them watch some of these documentaries and like, oh, I'm never going to eat sugar again. Hey, Dad, can I have some ice cream? <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and our kids still have ice cream, but it's it's ice cream made with glucose. Um, wow, so, that's fantastic. You know, it's not that hard to do. Um, and uh, Lizzie, my wife, uh, will, will knock off a batch once a week and one meal a week, they're allowed to have ice cream after it. They do. Uh, they, they enjoy it. Um, and uh, so she experiments with all different kinds of flavors. She does chocolate, she does ginger, she does strawberry, she does plain old vanilla. Um, but it's not a difficult thing to do, and so they don't miss out on ice cream. Um, I guess the other thing that you got to, we've got to get to a point in society where, at the moment, sugar is love. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, you know, it's a reward. It, it, it's it's uh, it's an easy reward. It, a kid plays sport, they give them sugar at half time, they give them sugar at full time, well done for playing sport. Kid yeah. does something good in school, give them some sugar. Um, kid behaves themselves while they're out shopping with you, give them some sugar. You know, Easter, That's give horrible. them some sugar. Uh, you know, it's, you can give kids treats without giving them sugar. Uh, yeah. You know, people say, what on earth do you do at Easter time? You know, you can't give them chocolate eggs. Well, no, but we give them gifts. Um, you know, they, they like a, a gift just as much as the next kid. Um, and so what if they can't eat it? Well, I don't know about you guys, um, and I know you don't celebrate Halloween, but um, some places here in the U.S. that celebrate Halloween have the switch witch. The switch witch will come along. And so the kids go out and they trick-or-treat. You know, they knock on the doors mm. and say trick-or-treat and somebody gives them candy. And they come back with this big pile of candy. So what we yep. do is we have the kids pick out, you know, five or seven pieces of the candy that they really want. And then the rest we put out at night when they go to bed out on the front porch in a bag. And the switch witch takes it as payment for a toy that they get. So in the oh, morning. Oh, that's a good idea. In the morning, there's yeah. a new toy for them, and they, they get a little bit of candy, sure, yeah. more than they would get normally, absolutely, but it's not like they're eating a whole bag. I mean, compare yeah. that to, I, I never heard of the Switch Witch when I was a kid. I, no. I've she certainly wasn't around, around where I lived, <laughs> and I would literally eat until I was sick, and then I would maybe even eat some more. I, I tried to eat all of my candy that night. That was my goal. And I absolutely <laughs> came close to it. And, and I would f probably finish all of my chocolate and the things like the, you know, the chewy things or the crunchy things I would save for later. But the, the interesting thing about that is, yes, you know, Halloween's probably something we, nobody really needs. But, and, and that's a great way of dealing with it. But it's not the once a year binge on candy that's the problem. No, it's the, it's, not. it's the it's the 40 teaspoons of sugar that the average child consumes every day of their lives that is not in candy, that is not in soda, but is in their breakfast cereal and is in their cereal bar and, you know, and is in their burger rolls and is in their condiments and their sauces. That's the problem. It's the every day of their lives bit, not the once a year bit. And and I think you also brought this up before, and this goes on with what you're talking about as the frequency of eating sugar is, is that it's it's in everything. Right now, there's this rampage, uh, witch hunt, if you will, against high fructose corn syrup. And I'm not saying it's it's not evil, but what I'm saying is it's not as bad as people want to believe. It's the fact that it is sugar and it's fructose as part of that sugar, just like cane sugar and beet sugar and it's everywhere it's in the ketchup the condiments the barbecue sauce pretty much any sauce and any salad dressing you're going to find sugar in anything with tomatoes you're going to find sugar added to it yeah absolutely uh, and um the so i did a guide i've actually analyzed the u.s supermarket and i, I published a guide which you can get on amazon uh, just a little book little ebook it's cheap um and all i've done is list all of the foods in U.S. supermarkets in every food category. So the condiments, the breads, everything 
um, and most of your uh, chain takeaway outlets, so McDonald's and Burger King and all of those, um, all of the foods in all of those places that have less than three grams per 100 grams of added sugar. Um, and so, and, and that's my rule of thumb. I say to, to anyone who asks, look, if you must eat processed food, follow this one rule. Look at the label if it's less than three grams per hundred. Now, I didn't realize that in the US that's just about impossible to do because you don't, yeah, it is. You don't publish the, the hundred gram amount on the food, which I don't think is by accident. Uh, you know, I, I, I find it hilarious that a Tic Tac has zero sugar according to your label, even though it's 97 grams per hundred sugar. The yeah. reason it's zero is because a serve of Tic Tac is one and that's less than half a gram and therefore they don't have to publish it. Um, so, yeah. you know, it's, but that's lawyers it, right there. Thank you very much. <laughs> but, <laughs> but you can work it out. And, and I've paid some people to do some very complicated mathematics to do that on the U S food supply. They've done it in this guide where they've worked out in every food category, all the brands of bread, all the condiments, everything. Um, worked out the ones that have less than three grams per hundred, which is what I say is the safe limit. If you if you can get a food that's less than three grams per hundred, then there is no significant quantity of added sugar in it. Um, and and so I've done that so that you can just go through any supermarket with that and say, okay, so these cereals are fine. These breads are fine. These condiments are fine. Uh, and, and the reason I did that was because of that labeling nightmare in the US where you can't actually even find out by reading the label. Um, so whereas at least in Europe and in Australia, you can you, because they're required to put the 100 gram amount. Um, wow, that's that's fantastic. I really wish we had a consistent serving size on things here. They're all over the place. Just well, thinking of a, the discretion of the manufacturer. Um, yeah, just breakfast cereal alone. Some some measure a serving as a quarter cup or, or a third cup or a half a cup or three quarters. Or of even a cup. worse, in the US, some of them measure it in grams. So <laughs> a country that doesn't use grams as a measurement they might as well measure it in, I don't know, Vulcans or something completely <laughs> made up. You know, measuring in grams in the US and saying a serve size of, of Kellogg's Corn Flakes is 45 grams. Who knows what that is? I don't know what that is. And it probably is about half what the average adult would consider a serve size of Kellogg's Corn Flakes. So, oh, you know, yeah, absolutely. It, it's. And, and the fact that they're allowed to do that is is obscene. Uh, yeah. But at least you've got the control mechanism here of the per hundred gram amount, so that you can at least see what the percentage of sugar is. Um, and 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 that's a big help. So anyway, so I've, I've published that. It's as I said, it's available on Amazon. It's called the um, the U.S. Sugar Free Shoppers Guide, and it's just an ebook, a cheap little ebook that you can download that has all that info in it. You have one of those for several countries. So it's the uh, Sugar Free Shoppers Guide. You have one for Australia and UK yeah. and North America. Yeah. Anything else? Uh, those ones, no. What I wanted to add, though, is about the, your point about high fructose corn syrup. Um, it's just what you use to make the sugar. I mean, the end game, as far as the food manufacturing industry is, is to have something that's half glucose and half fructose because they know that that's what humans like. Uh, that's, that's sugar. Um, now, in the US, it's economically cheaper to do that from corn, and hence you've got high fructose toast corn syrup in australia it's economically cheaper to do that from cane uh, right. and in europe it's cheaper to do it from beets uh, so there they have beet sugar here we have cane sugar there you have corn sugar essentially um it doesn't matter it's just labeling it's all the same thing biochemically it's irrelevant and so that's why we find it hilarious i, I really and I'm, I'm not really meaning to be mean here but it just is so funny when you see things like that announcement i think it was mcdonald's that announced last week in the u.s uh, um that they were going to take all the high fructose corn syrup out of their buns um and replace it with sugar and yeah. they made that announcement as you know we're worried about the health of our consumers obesity rates etc we're taking all that high fructose corn syrup out and we're replacing it with cane sugar. And that's just so funny because that's taking sugar out and replacing it with sugar. Yeah, it's like an alcoholic saying, I, I quit drinking. I'm only I'm I'm only gonna drink I'm not gonna drink vodka anymore. I'm only gonna drink tequila or gin. Because right. <laughs> that unhealthy vodka. I've heard vodka makes you really, really fat, so I'm gonna switch to to tequila. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's it it really is is quite annoying in how many People are so certain that high fructose corn syrup is what's causing our obesity epidemic. Uh, well, it is, but 
<laughs> there is some thoughts on the fact that the fructose and glucose are not bound to each other, and therefore the fructose gets absorbed more quickly. And Nonsense. you know what Absolutely. else that what else that might actually do? But I don't think it makes a significant difference. Well, and the reason it doesn't make a difference is that we have in our saliva the enzymes required to split sucrose into glucose and fructose. So while it might hit our mouths as separate uh, molecules, uh, we, we deal with that pretty efficiently. Right. Well, I'm I'm really impressed with your body of work there, David. And uh, I, I would like to kind of go over some of your uh, your books you've written. Your first one was Sweet Poison: Why Sugar Makes Us Fat. Then you came up with the Sweet Poison Quick Plan, correct? Yeah. Uh, so that was really because uh, that was really because the the first one was uh, long on science and short on practical. Um, and people said, oh, that's all really scary and terrifying, <laughs> but uh, what am I supposed to do about it? Uh, and so the second one was the how-to. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, and then, of course, the cookbook and, let's see, Big Fat Lies, Sick, Fat, and Poor. What's that one about? So Big Fat Lies is looking at the, my first foray into the world of fat. Uh, and, and what I discovered in doing the research on sugar is that, there, yes, there's been a lot of sugar added to our food supply over the last 200 years, but in the last 100 years, all of the fat in our food supply has been transformed from being largely animal fat um, to largely man-made fats extracted from seeds, or what I call seed oils, and what's described on the labels as vegetable oils. I'm talking about soybean oil, cottonseed oil, uh, canola oil, those sorts of things. Uh, that now is the dominant fat in our food supply. In fact, it's the pr almost the only fat in our food supply except dairy. Um, that has changed our food supply dramatically and much more cataclysmically dangerous for us than even what's been happening with the sugar. And that's because the science says definitively and much, much more definitively than it ever did with sugar, this stuff causes cancer. Uh, and the reason why we are seeing uh, the incidence of all cancers double, triple, quadruple over the last 30 or 40 years is we have fundamentally changed a critical aspect of our food supply, which is the type of fat being used. Um, and that's what Big Fat Lies introduces as a concept and it's followed up with toxic oil, which is once again, the how-to, which is thanks for terrifying us half to death. Now what do we do about it? Uh, and, that's, <laughs> and that's what toxic oil is about. Okay, that's what I was going to bring up next. It sounded like you were leading into it. Now, as far as these toxic oils, is that just seed oils or would that go into any other types of vegetable like corn or coconut or avocado or olive? So it's any oil that is very high in polyunsaturated fats. So fruit oils as a general rule, so that's olive, coconut, avocado. Uh, those are fruit oils and they are all fine. Um, there's nothing wrong with those. Good. They are traditional foods in our, in our food supply. It is the ones that have required industrial intervention to extract the fat from, which results in very high polyunsaturated fat numbers. So I'm talking about largely uh, fats which are extracted from seeds or legumes. So soybean oil, peanut oil, uh, canola oil, sunflower oil, cottonseed oil, grapeseed oil, rice bran oil. Those are all in that category of very, very high in polyunsaturated fats. And those are the ones of concern. They are also the cheapest oils that you can buy, the cheapest source of fat, which is, of course, why the food industry uses them. They are much, much less expensive than any of the fruit oils that I mentioned um, or any of the, um, the animal fats, which are also, of course, safe. Yeah, that's a shame. It, it is everywhere, and most of the times it is hydrogenated also, which makes it dual. Well, it's only, it's only hydrogenated because they had to do that to it to make it look like animal fat and behave like animal fat, i.e. be solid at room temperature. Um, they've gotten around that recently. I mean, most countries in the world now don't hydrogenate. U.S. is lagging a little, but they're getting there. Um, it's, it's not the fact of hydrogenation that makes them dangerous. It's what's being hydrogenated, which is the seed oils. <laughs> you oh, okay. don't get trans fats in food that aren't full of seed oils because trans fats come from the seed oils. Um, so uh, worrying about trans fats is a bit of a red herring. Worry about the fat that is in the food. And if you pick up any article in any supermarket in the United States, you will see on the label vegetable oil. I guarantee you no vegetables were harmed to make that oil. It is in fact seed oils and it is very, very bad for you. Well, that's good to know. So what are you working on now or what's your latest book? 
Um, my latest book is is uh, a little bit of a, a divergence from this. So I, I, I took a detour a, a year or two ago and wrote a book about the education system in Australia called Free Schools uh, in, and a guide to parents to how to choose the best school for their children, you know, what matters in education, what doesn't. So all the things that don't, you know, that everyone thinks do like class sizes and mixed classes and all that kind of thing, what the research really says about this. Uh, and another divergence from my nutritional line is coming up, which is um, uh, psychopaths, um, how to live and work with a psychopath. So there has been enormous strides forwards in psychopathy over the last probably five years with the introduction of MRI uh, studies of psychopaths. Uh, and uh, I want to document what that evidence is telling us about what they are, what motivates them, what doesn't motivate them, and how to deal with them. I see a, a documentary in your future. <laughs> Oh, I've already done one of those. I've already done one. So uh, I don't know if you've heard of it, that sugar film. Um, it's uh, one done by an Australian, uh, Damon Gamo. Um, really good film. Stephen Fry's in it. Um, uh, various other uh, very important and influential people. And I get a little bit of a cameo in there as well. Yeah, I, I saw you. I saw that film. I think it's great. I think it is probably the best film I've seen on sugar, on the topic of sugar. Out of Out of all those that are out there, that was the one that I felt was the most informational and entertaining. Yeah, well, uh, Damon, wanted, uh, Damon read Sweet Poison, um, thought this has got to be turned, you know, we've got to make a movie that com communicates this message. He got in touch, it was years ago now, um, and yeah, we worked uh, on that. It was Damon's film, uh, but I helped out wherever I could. And um, the aim, Damon's aim was to produce something that, that communicated it clearly and effectively um, and accurately, but was at the same time entertaining. Yeah, well, that's great. I didn't know what your role was on that, but it was a, it was really a fantastic film. I'm I'm uh, I'm thrilled it's out there. I intend to uh, can, to promote it as much as I can, and uh, hopefully that sells some more books for you. Because I, I definitely think we're on a on a quest in the right direction. We just need to change public opinion and attitude. And sugar is not the band aid for a boo boo. Sugar is not comfort. Sugar is not love. Sugar no. is poison well it's an addictive chemical um that will really really hurt you and your kids and that's something you got to remember when you see it on the label of anything you're going to put in your mouth that's true that's true so i'm going to have links to your books um and also you have two websites davidgillespie.org and howmuchsugar.com i'll put those on my show notes page under uh for lift fit podcast is do you have any uh Oh, yeah, well, the Facebook page is probably a better, um, well, not better, I mean, I don't know what your feelings about Facebook are, but on Facebook, I actually run my Facebook page, um, which is just, it's called David Gillespie, um, and at Sweet David G is the Facebook short thing. Um, it's, it, I am on that every day, and people pose questions and, and all that kind of thing, and we discuss the latest stories, like that one about burgers, um, you know, on a, on a daily basis. So if, if people want to interact, um, that's, that's the place to go. Fantastic. I will make sure that I have that link on my show notes page as well, so people can find you and communicate with you. Great. Thank well, you very thank, much, Ben. Thank you very much, David. It's been a pleasure talking with you. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I hope all our listeners really get something out of it. Thanks. It's been a pleasure. All right. You take care. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Live Fit Podcast. Please subscribe and share with someone you care about. Read show notes, articles, resources, and learn more about our weight management programs at livefitpodcast.com. Once again, Thanks for listening and always remember to live fit.